But Jared, it's great to have you with us. If you don't mind uh, just giving an introduction on yourself and then you can jump in and with your presentation. Do you have my screen here? Yes. Awesome. All right, hi everyone. My name is Jared Rotinsky. Uh, happy to be with you today. I usually have a, a standing meeting every Tuesday at 11, which is a huge bummer because I'm not able to make it on here. Um, been on several times in the past and always regret when I am not able to join. Um, I'm the Chief Strategy Officer here at Rev Road. Rev Road, for those of you that don't know, is a startup accelerator. Uh, so we, we trade equity for services and the companies that we take on. Um, can give a little bit more info at the end of my presentation here, but happy to be with you. Um, product market fit is uh, not something that can be talked about in, in 12 minutes. I mean, this is a topic that really uh, deserves months, if not years of study by all of us. Um, I certainly am not a qualified expert on this, uh, but it is something that I deal with day in and day out with all of the portfolio companies that we have here at, uh, at Rev Road. So just want to make it clear that the resources that I'm using for, um, for my slides today are twofold. One of them uh, is a gentleman named Max Menke. He's a co-founder of GrowthX. And I just put a link um, in the chat to a, a really good video that he did for us here at Rev Road. It's been a couple of years now, uh, but the content of this video is fantastic. It is a bit long. It's about an hour and a half. So if you watch it, which I highly recommend, I do uh, suggest that you put it on 2x speed. It's just a YouTube video. Um, and he'll sound like Alvin and the Chipmunks, you know, yapping away at 2x speed, but uh, you, you can definitely glean a lot. Highly, highly recommend this, uh, this video. And then the other resource that I use is a, a great book. Most of you, I'm sure, have read it. It's called Nail It, Then Scale It. Um, if you haven't read it, again, highly recommend. And I, I point out these resources, um, obviously, number one, to give credit where credit is due. None of these ideas that I'll be talking about are mine, but um, also as a way to cover my tail in case anything is wrong. <laughs> um, these are other people's ideas that I'm presenting, but I do fully support them. Um, so just real briefly, kind of a, an agenda of what I'll walk through. Product market fit, the three things that I hope to cover are uh, definition. So what does it mean? Um, second, how is it achieved? And third, how is it measured? So that is what we'll be walking through. First, um, for definition, Mark Andreessen, who's uh, a lot of people call him the father of the modern VC, he, he's arguably the most recognizable name in venture capital. Um, he has this famous definition that you have all probably heard. He said that product market fit means being in a good market with a product that can satisfy that market. Um, when I read this, I think, okay, great. That, that to me sounds a little bit Zen-like, right? Like it, it's being in a good market with a, a good product. Um, I don't necessarily glean a lot of, um, of specifics out of this definition. I'm not uh, trying to to put down the father of modern venture capital. But um, to me, this definition is just a little bit difficult to grasp. And uh, Max Menke, this gentleman that I, I mentioned in my first slide who gave the presentation, uh, he has a better definition, in my mind at least. Um, at, at a minimum, it's an alternate definition. And that definition is the product market fit is your ability to acquire revenue using a proven, predictable, and repeatable method. And I'm gonna leave this slide up just for a minute to let it sink in. The first time that I, I saw this, I had to pause his video and just taste it in my mouth for a few seconds. Product market fit is your ability to acquire revenue using a proven, predictable, and repeatable method. To me, this is a much better definition just because it, it basically means, look, if you're making money and you know how to make that money, and you're able to continue doing it, that's product market fit. Um, product market fit really is, is defined by the scientific method. It, it's not something that we can wish into existence. It's a truth that exists, and it's up to us to find it. 
right? It, it's discovering what it is out there that people want and are willing to open up their wallets for. Uh, George Quest has a great quote. He says here, the most important entrepreneurial characteristic is intellectual honesty above all. Intellectual honesty is a willingness to face up to facts rigorously, whether they prove you right or wrong. So I, I always like to think of this journey of finding product market fit as just really being following the scientific method that we all learned when we were in seventh grade, right? It's asking a, a question, gathering information and doing research, forming a hypothesis, experimenting, and then drawing a conclusion. And it's absolutely key as we go through that process to be intellectually honest. Now, what does that mean? That means don't listen to your spouse who just keeps patting you on the back and saying, great job, this is such a good idea. All right, it's not listening to your coworkers or your neighbors that you explain this idea to. Everyone is going to think that you have product market fit when you explain their idea if they're your friend, right? Great job, Jared, that sounds like an awesome idea. You're gonna make millions. No, the way that you can really find out what product market fit is, is by experimenting and iterating over and over and over again until you are getting people to open up their wallets in a predictable, proven, and repeatable way. So to achieve product market fit, these are the three steps that I like to have in my brain of what we need to nail to make it happen. And again, this harkens back to the book that I mentioned, uh, Nail It, Then Scale It which I highly recommend if you haven't read it. So first, nailing the pain. Second, nailing the ICP, the ideal customer profile. And then third, nailing the solution. So briefly to touch on all three of those, nailing the pain. We often hear people talk about mosquito bites and shark bites, right? A mosquito bite is a minor nuisance. It's something that, yeah, it bothers me a little bit. Am I gonna go out of my way to fix a problem? Eh, maybe, maybe not. A shark bite is a, an immediate, I have to escape this pain kind of feeling, right? Vitamins and painkillers are what we use to get rid of either shark bites or mosquito bites. If you have a mosquito bite, you probably only need a vitamin. If you have a shark bite, you need painkillers. So something that I like to ask um, entrepreneurs when they come into Rev Road, whether they're pitching for the first time or whether they've been part of the portfolio for a year is to honestly ask yourself, is your product addressing a shark bite or a mosquito bite? And I can tell you if the honest answer, if you're being intellectually honest with yourself and saying, you know what, honestly, this problem is more of a mosquito bite, then I can tell you your product is probably a vitamin, not a painkiller. It is so much more difficult to find product market fit if you're selling vitamins to people with mosquito bites. Nail It and Scale It has a great quote. It says, a monetizable customer pain represents a customer pain so significant that the customers will return the cold calls of an unknown startup to solve it. Now, th this is a little bit of hyperbole, right? Um, I don't know of anyone really who returns cold calls, even if it is a terrible pain. But the idea is, look, if you're addressing something that people can honestly still live with, the pain isn't that bad, you probably ought to be searching elsewhere if you really want to have a product that achieves product market fit. And a lot of that has to do, honestly, as well with addressing the customer, the ICP, the ideal customer profile. When, uh, when we take companies on here at Rev Road, one of the exercises that we like to do is asking them to describe their ICP. Who are your customers? Who do you sell to? And you would be shocked at how many people say, uh, well, my ICP is, uh, is moms. M moms? M moms is not a customer profile. Moms is a, that's a blanket statement of 70 million people in America. That, that's not a customer profile. Okay, well, my, uh, my ideal customer profile is, uh, is you know, working moms. Okay, a little bit better, still not great, right? An ICP is, is almost painfully narrow and specific, especially in the early days when you're trying to find your product market fit. The more narrow, the better, right? If you want to say, my ideal customer profile is uh, a working mom 
in X industry who makes X amount of money, whose educational profile is X, and so on and so forth, now you're starting to nail what your ICP is. If you have this massive broad idea of who is gonna buy your product and who's gonna be interested in your service, odds are you are not going to succeed in finding product market fit because there are so few things that from the get-go, from the early stages, you can address that big of a need from the early days. So we always advise our entrepreneurs to find a very specific, very niche ICP. And furthermore, we advise them to come up with multiple ones that they want to test. All right, so testing here is critical. This is a sample ICP that uh, one of our more recent portfolio companies developed. Um, they are a, let's see, how can I describe them? They're a, a, a texting service that allows influencers to get their content out to subscribers via a paid subscription. All right, so they're targeting people on Instagram or TikTok that have these massive followings and they want a way to, uh, to monetize that following in, in ways other than just ad revenue or, or paid partnerships, right? They wanna be able to text out their content and, um, and have a paid subscription. And furthermore, they want analytics on who is going to interact with that content. Okay, so we built this sample ICP. Um, what we found is that it literally took us five or six different versions until we finally felt that we got this right. And I won't show you what we ended up coming up with because it's their proprietary thing, but this is version one. Okay, so if you're looking at this and thinking, yeah, that actually looks pretty good. That's a detailed ICP. No, no, no. This was version one that we then had to revise five or six more times until we finally made it to the point where we said, okay, we think we've nailed it. We've tested it enough times. We think we finally know who our customer is. Once you have your, your sample ICP here, what we encourage people to do is put together this matrix, <coughs> excuse me, and evaluate as you're going out and, and doing your testing of each ICP, whether or not you think you found it. And this is a sample of different things that you can test. I'll just run through a couple of them here. So the need, you're gonna be measuring the fit. Is there no fit, workable fit, or complete fit? All right, on need, you have no fit if your ICP doesn't have the problem you're trying to solve. You have a workable fit. Now, maybe you're gonna have a little bit of success if your customer acknowledges the problem but doesn't really think it's a priority. You have complete fit if they have the problem and they're actively searching for the solution. All right, so hopefully you can get to the point where everything on this matrix, you've got you know, threes or 2.5s all the way through. That's when you know that you have a product, or excuse me, an ICP that is likely going to fit with what you have. All right, so nailing the pain is all about finding out if you have a shark bite or a mosquito bite and whether you're offering a painkiller or a vitamin. It's about finding the right ICP. Once you've done that, the next step in product market fit is nailing the solution. This is probably, if I had to guess, the most common killer that we see um, in entrepreneurs. They actually are pretty good if they force themselves to do the process correctly at finding a good pain. You're, you're good at getting out into the field and talking to people and discovering what really um, you know, is getting in their way of success and, and great, we know that that's a pain. Now let's make a solution to fix it. This is where people tend to fall flat on their face. And what they do here is they go straight to the, the sellable product. In other words, they skip the prototyping, they skip the MVP, and they just dump unholy amounts of time and money into building something without first testing it to see, okay, I know that this problem exists, but does this solution actually address that problem? And the only way that you can do that is through prototyping and testing, All right? So the prototype is the first thing you should build. And obviously this will vary depending on if you have a SaaS product or a physical hard good product, but the concept is the same. You don't need to spend too much money to build your, your prototype. You can put together wireframes, okay? And just show it to people. The key is put together a prototype and start taking that out on a dog and pony show. 
and, and don't try to sell people on it, but just get their honest input. Do you think that this product, if it moves out of prototype stage, would solve this pain that you have helped me identify? And probably you're going to need to go through a few versions of testing that. Once you think that the prototype is in good shape, that's when you move to an MVP uh, and nail it or, and then scale it. They call it the MFS, the minimum feature set um, that you can begin introducing to early adopters. And again, it's that iterative process. It's doing it multiple times until you have enough people say, you know what, this is scratching my itch. I think that this solution is going to solve the problem that I have. That's when you go and move on to a, a sellable product. Finally, how do you measure product market fit? Again, I go back to um, that, that Zen-like photo that I had on the first slide. Um, you know, is this something where you just feel like you've arrived, you're sitting on a cloud and, and you've got it? Yeah, well, maybe. But in my mind, I, I just keep going back to revenue. Is someone actually paying you for this solution that you've came up with to address their pain? When you're talking to people and asking them to help you validate your idea, if they give you your time, to me, that validates that they have a pain. If they're at least willing to, to give you a half an hour and say, yeah, you know what? You're working on this, come talk to me. I, I experience this pain a lot. Let me tell you about it. That at least validates that you're, you're working on the right track, right? They have a pain. But to validate your solution, it's a simple test. Are they giving you money? And are you able to continually bring them back, again, going back to that definition, using a repeatable and proven and predictable method? Are you generating revenue? It's that simple. Um, other rules of thumb that people talk about in the industry, it's the 40% rule. Uh, so this is if you survey people post-launch, once you already have a product or a service out there and, um, and ask your not friends, but your actual users out in the wild, if this product or service were to be taken away, how would you feel? And the rule of thumb is if 40% or more say um, that, that they would be very disappointed if that product were taken away, that's kind of uh, this measurement that the experts will tell you that's product market fit, All right? On the other side, if you haven't launched yet, if this is still an idea phase and you put it out there in the wild, not to your friends, but to actual potential customers, and at least 40% of people say, yep, this is a must have, gotta have this, that's a good ind indication that you're on the right track. Um, VCs as a rule of thumb, and, and this is different in every ecosystem, but um, a generally accepted rule of thumb is that you need to have a million dollars in ARR before a VC is going to look at you and say, yeah, I think they found product market fit. And furthermore, it's how quickly have you gotten there, right? They don't want to see that it's taken you 15, 20 years to ramp up to a million in ARR. They want to see consistent double digit month over month growth. In their minds, and I'm, I'm speaking uh, very generally, but that's a good indicator to a VC that you have achieved product market fit. A million in ARR and you got there quickly. Near consistent month over month double digit growth. Um, some final thoughts here. We always encourage people to fail fast. And uh, again, this harkens back to that iterative process. It is so, uh, so common, so depressingly common to see people that just jump to the end and, and they think that they know exactly what the pain is and they know exactly what the solution is to solve that pain. And they spend so much money and so much time building that product only to then discover that no one wants to buy it. The much better path is to nail it and then scale it. It's iterating just constantly, quickly, testing, 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 experimenting, and doing everything you can to not spend money until you think that you're actually nailing it. Uh, another final thought here is to get into the field. Move beyond the realm of talking to your friends, your coworkers, your co-founders, your family about this. You need to actually go have problem interviews and solution interviews. Actually sit down in the offices with the people who will be buying your product and talk to them about whether or not you're on the right track. Have brutal intellectual honesty in those conversations and, and 
tell yourself going in that you don't care what the truth is. You just want to find it. You're not trying to validate that you're right about a pain or a solution. You're just trying to find out what they really perceive as a pain and a solution. Um, premature scaling equals near certain death. We, uh, we unfortunately see so many companies that go through this. They think, again, that they've nailed it early on. They hire you know, sales teams and they build out version five of the product and they're, they're scaling as if they have you know, multiple million dollars coming through, but really they just haven't done the work yet to find out, shoot, what we built actually isn't addressing a monetizable pain. Um, this one is so difficult for us as entrepreneurs because we're, we're convinced in our minds that we know that that pain exists, right? We know that this solution fixes that pain. Well, we can't start scaling until we've had other people validate that for us. And finally here, the last thought is, uh, we always say that the difference between a startup that fails and one that succeeds is how much capital they have in their runway, um, basically how much time they have to achieve that product market fit. And if you have limited capital, that's okay. You can compensate for that by just being really good at this iterative process. Be really good at testing quickly, failing fast, and moving on to the next one. That doesn't mean move on to a whole nother idea. That just means tweaking what you think the pain is and what you think the solution is to solve that pain quickly, over and over and over again, spending as little money as possible until you finally feel like you're nailing it. So at Rev Road, um, just in closing, this is what we try to do. We, we try to help entrepreneurs find their product market fit quickly and cheaply and in a way that um, is actually validated by the market. So for those of you that don't know what we do, we invest in, in companies um, in an equity for services trade. So our thesis is that most startups don't fail because of lack of funding, rather they fail because of lack of know-how. And that's not a knock on you or me or any entrepreneur out there. It's just that the, the truth is that a lot of us have a hard time doing it on our own. And it's a lot easier to travel that road with someone who's done it before. So when we invest in companies, we offer two years of service agreement where we jump in and actually become part of your team. And um, we allow you to choose all the carts. There's 12 different options that people can choose from, finance, legal, strategy, uh, marketing, sales, whatever you need, you take it. And then we, in exchange, um, get your equity just like you would if we were giving you cash in a, in a typical VC deal. So that's who we are. I encourage you to look us up. Um, and I'm more than happy to take any questions. Thanks, Jared. That was awesome. Super helpful. I think there are a fair amount of comments uh, in the chat. If you want to take a quick look at some of those and, and maybe start addressing some. Um, Absolutely. I think the first one I'll just read out to you from Chad. How do you draw the line from workshopping the ICP internally to launching the first test? Oh, th there's hardly any line. Um, it, when it comes, Chad, to testing, um, we're, we're talking like minimal work to be done, right? You're, you're not writing uh, a binder, a business plan, and then going to test that binder. You're writing a lean canvas. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard of the lean canvas, highly recommend it. Basically, the idea is you write a one page sheet and it's got nine segments on that sheet and, and it explains everything from the problem you think you've identified to the solution and then boom, you go test it. So I'm talking like a day of work, right, of, of ideating and thinking, OK, I think this is what the problem is and then just immediately go test it. No reason at all to, to wait. Awesome question. I'm glad you asked that. And I'm sorry, Taylor, I'm trying to see the, the chat. No worries. Um, just some discussion between uh, Alan and Jeff around SharkBite and when that should be used and how it can be used. Um, Alan and Jeff, if you want to unmute yourselves and add any context to your comments, that would be helpful. Yeah, <clears throat> well, in, in my case, uh, just looking at people that would be using my technology would be authorized by somebody 
higher up than them. And so as somebody who is experiencing what they consider to be a, um, a, a mosquito bite, because they've been doing their job for such a long time, but if they're going to be using our technology, they'll say, well, that's okay. And then I don't mind. It'll show up. Whereas the, the higher up that hired us to come in and do the work for them will actually see a bigger return on investment for uh, our services. Yeah. So, so we, some something that nail it, uh, nail it, then scale it really pushes hard that I appreciate is when you go to do these tests, ideally you have the entire buying panel. They call it the buying panel. So you have the economic buyer uh, who's kind of the high up decision maker. You have the technical buyer who is, uh, you know, a, we're talking about a SaaS product here. This is the person in the company responsible for implementing the tech. And then you have the user. And ideally, you get all three of those people in the room as you're having these discussions, uh, because not only does that um, shine a lot of light to you on, OK, have I identified a pain or a, and a solution, but it also gives you a lot of great insight for the next step down the road, which is going to be when it comes time to, to nail the go to market strategy. You already know how that that food chain works, right? You, you know that, OK, in this type of industry, the end user really doesn't have much say and the economic buyer. Yeah. They kind of don't care either. They'll spend on whatever. I really got to convince that middle one, you know, the, the technical buyer or whatever the case may be. But the, the idea is in these problem and solution interviews, you have the whole buying panel, the economic buyer, the technical buyer and the user all present as you're having that discussion. Hmm. Okay. Um, another comment on shark bites and mosquito bites, like I, I kind of get a little uncomfortable using it. Like th the reality is a lot of money has been made selling vitamins for mosquito bites, right? Like um, it, just, just because you don't have people beating down your door, demanding, saying, I have a shark bite, I need this product. You can still be successful, right? The idea here, and, and especially if we're talking about um, like an e-commerce product, um, like I, I didn't go beat down the doors of, uh, of the store to buy a pair of shoes, but yeah, I do demand shoes, right? Um, the, the idea is that you just know that whatever you have to offer isn't a ho-hum, like, yeah, your, your mom thinks that's a great idea, but when it comes time to open up the wallet, yeah, not so much. So can you sell vitamins to take care of mosquito bites and make a lot of money? Absolutely. A lot of people do it. It's just that you're way more likely to have success if you can find something so painful that anecdotally nail it and scale it says, yeah, someone's going to return a cold call from an unknown startup because you claim that you can solve that problem. Your odds of success are just that much higher. Okay. Jared, one thing that I would note there on the nail it and scale it kind of shark bite mosquito bite one of the companion documents i'd call it is the the big idea canvas yep. and it's got that grading of shark bite versus mosquito bite and it's just one data point in maybe 20 or 25 that you can consider as you're assessing your product so i would use it as that kind of a data point and if you look at it in the grand scheme of things, you have to take that into account that it's not an end all be all or deal killer. Totally. And uh, again, I'm just going to put in a plug. I'm not like on the sales team for the nail it then scale it crew, but it, it really is a good resource. Uh, for those of you who haven't gone through it yet, uh, go buy a used copy on Amazon for six bucks and, uh, and spend the next five days just plowing through it. It, it is awesome. Um, and, and I feel like I, I didn't do a good enough job pushing this video. I just, again, put a link uh, in the chat to watch this YouTube video. Um, and, and look, I'm being totally transparent. Like uh, this gentleman, Max Menke, who's the presenter, he's actually from a competing startup accelerator. <laughs> like that's how good this content is that, that I'm showing you this. It is awesome. Um, he really does a good job of, of helping people frame like, don't do anything until you're certain that you actually have a problem, a pain. And furthermore, don't do anything until you actually know 
who it is specifically that has that pain. Nail your ICP, you know, to the T until you start going out to create your solution and, and just walking people through these steps. So again, this is such a heavy topic. There's no way we can cover it with this limited amount of time, but it's probably the most crucial thing, right? It's that buzzword, that buzz phrase, product market fit that everyone talks about. And yeah, that's the key to success. Well, great. So how do we do it? It's a, it's a big topic, right? Um, those two resources, nail it, then scale it. And then this video that I put in the link are phenomenal. Um, Chad is asking, are there certain industry stages, types of companies that are good fits for RevRoad? Chad, we're industry agnostic. We're also stage agnostic. So we've we've taken on um, pre-revenue all the way up through, uh, you know, folks on series A or B. Um, so totally depends. We take on everyone. Jared, I think you're right. Like this is a topic that is supremely important and supremely large. So really appreciate your time. I think we're at time right now. And I would just highly suggest if any of you have additional questions, reach out to Jared. Um, Rev Road has some amazing resources as well, just generally available. So uh, take a look at those. But Jared, really appreciate your time going through this. Are you able or willing to uh, make this presentation available to the Midday Connect group? Or is this Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right, Jerry. Okay. If yeah. you don't mind just getting that to Hannah, then we can distribute this to the to the attendees today. But really appreciate your time. Um, thanks so much, Jared. This was awesome. Cool. Great to be with you all. Good luck. Thanks, Jared. Thanks, we'll see Jared. you. Bye-bye. See you all next Tuesday.